Hi, my name is Joshua Fuentes, and welcome back to a brand new episode of What to Teach, where I share with you truths from God's Word that you can discuss with any Bible study group. And before we begin, would you please like, share, and subscribe so you can stay up to date on the latest What to Teach videos and to encourage your Bible study groups to prepare themselves to hear God's Word. So with that said, here is what you can teach from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 26. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of our hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. That's Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 26. The context for our Bible study is King Nebuchadnezzar's audacious attempt to get his entire kingdom to worship him. Nebuchadnezzar was so focused on this that he even built a huge idol of himself made out of gold so his entire kingdom could bow down. He got music. He got everything you could think of to ensure that he would receive praise and honor as the king. However, his plan actually goes sideways when he learns that three of his wisest counselors, Shadmach, Meshach, and Abednego, have chosen not to worship him. Instead, they have chosen to worship God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believe that their true loyalties, above all else, always relies to their one true king, who is God, their Savior. And because they serve God, they will not bow, bend their knee to Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, this gets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into some hot fire, could we say? And this actually leads them to experiencing a life or death situation. However, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego remained faithful. And their account is a teachable lesson for us to remind us that we too are going to experience times where we are going to be challenged in the faith. And yes, our life may be on the line. However, even though our life is on the line to follow God, we know that our God is capable of saving our lives. Which brings us to our first teaching truth, which is this. God is able. That's what we discover in the text, is that right before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be thrown into the fire, they are given one more attempt to bow their knee to Nebuchadnezzar. However, they refuse. They aren't even going to believe in themselves to do such a thing or tempt themselves to do such a thing. No, instead, they are not going to bow down. And of course, their answer is remarkable. It's amazing. In fact, it actually causes Nebuchadnezzar to step back for a moment. Are you sure? Will you not bow to me? If you won't, you will be burned alive. And the answer is, our God is able. Our God 
can save us. However, here's what we also need to recognize. They believe God will save them. However, they also understand that they may not be saved by God. However, in the end, regardless of what happens, they are not going to worship Nebuchadnezzar. They are going to worship God. And of course, I believe that the reason why they are going to worship God, whether he does save them or if he allows them to die, is because they know whether they live now or if they die, they are going to be with God. They are still going to be alive. And there is nothing that Nebuchadnezzar can do who can take that away from them. That's what we need to remember. That's what we are called to do. That no matter what happens, who may be over us, our number one allegiance is to God. And that He alone should have our allegiance and our fear because of what He is capable of doing. Look at how Jesus talks about this in the Gospel of Matthew. Look what He says. He says this, A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 33. Jesus reminds us that, yes, as followers of him, we will be persecuted the same way he was persecuted. However, that does not mean that God does not love us. That does not mean that we are not faithfully following God. If anything, that's just a reminder that we are truly faithfully following Jesus. Because to faithfully follow Jesus means we will end up in situations where we will experience some persecution. However, because that is a reality for those who follow God, Jesus reminds us that in those moments, we need to fear God over any earthly authority. Yes, even though the earthly authority can kill us and will even try to do such things, ultimately, it is God who can kill both body and the soul. It is God who has power over today and tomorrow and when we die. And because God has that power, he is the one we should fear and ultimately align ourselves with, regardless of the circumstance and what may happen. And of course, Jesus reminds us that yes, even though we are going to experience such circumstances, our God still cares about us. Our God still loves us. Our God can spare us in such situations. And if he does spare us in such situations and we experience loss because we have chosen him over our earthly authorities, he will take care of us. He will ensure that we are okay and that we will continue to prosper in him. However, if he allows us to die, well, guess what? Because we acknowledged him before men, that means he will acknowledge us before his heavenly father. We still win we still receive our great prize, which is eternal eternity with him. We can have the abundant life today and eternal life with him when we die. So either ways, with Jesus, we still win. So how can any of us win? Well, it's by putting faith and trust in Jesus Christ, believing in him as God's one and only son who came and lived the perfect life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice on the cross for our sin, for our failure. Our Jesus, he paid the death penalty we deserve for our sin on the cross. And because he did that, three days later, God the Father raised him from the dead and he is still alive today as our only means for salvation. Yes, it is incredible. It is amazing to have a God who loves and cares for you so much, who will watch out over you, protect you, and be with you regardless of the circumstance. And yes, to follow him means we must remain faithful. We must remain steadfast because we are on solid ground, because we have hope knowing that whatever happens in this life, our God is able. 
He will save us. He'll save us either today or he'll save us when we die. That's the God we serve. That's the God we hope in. And that's the God we look forward to. Truly, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a true testimony and a true example of what it means to fear God over anyone else because they understood it is better to die today and to live in all eternity with God than to deny Him today than to be separated from Him for all eternity. We need to remember that as follower of believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, and we need to make that our sure foundation and to encourage ourselves and one another every single day so that we remain faithful. Of course, we recognize that because we live in a broken and fallen world, that means we're going to experience broken and fallen consequences, either by ourselves or because of others. And of course, when we look at this text in this Bible study, we see that there is one particular sin that is standing out above all else that we need to be aware of and that we need to avoid, which brings us to our very next teaching truth, which is this, pride kills. Yes, I know that is a very simple statement, a very simple truth. However, it is one that we need to take to heart every single day. So what is pride? Well, pride is having more faith in our own ability, in our own power, in our own wealth, in our own status, above the God who gave all of that to us. That is what Satan desires for every single person, every one of God's creation to cultivate in their lives is pride. Because what pride does is ultimately do what Nebuchadnezzar did, and that is to make us believe we are God. And of course, when we believe we are God, what does that do? Well, ultimately, it kills. It kills ourselves, and it also kills others. It makes us believe that we have all power to force people to do our bidding that actually can lead them to their destruction. That's exactly what happens to Nebuchadnezzar's men. He is so full of pride, so full of fury, because he was not worshipped that he caused his men to create such a great fire that it cost them their lives. Pride will blind us and it will ensure that we actually experience a downfall, that we experience destruction in everything that we do. And ultimately, what will it do? It will cost us our lives. It will cost us our lives because we will reject God as our ultimate savior and it will cause us to believe that we are our saviors. When the truth is, we can't save ourselves. So we must avoid pride at all costs. And how are we to avoid pride? It is to humble ourselves. Look at how Jesus talks about this once again in the Gospel of Matthew. He says this, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens and hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their flactories broad and their fingers long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no, no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Wow, what incredible words from Jesus. And I love what he says. And as a reminder to us all to look into our lives, to make sure that we don't have any such pride in our life. Once again, what do we see pride will do? Pride will make us believe any sort of service is beneath us. In fact, what pride will do is that we will hold other people to greater standards than we will hold to ourselves. And ultimately, what it will cause us to do is make us seek the high seat so that we can receive praise, so that we can receive honor. All of these things go against everything of what Jesus commands us to do. In fact, when we continue in pride, what do we learn? That is exalting ourselves, and that will lead us to humility. It will cause us to be humbled by God because He will see our pride, and He will judge us for it. However, if we're willing to humble ourselves, if we're willing to recognize we need Jesus, 
that we are hopeless without him. When we recognize that no person is beneath our service and that we're going to do anything and everything and be willing to serve anyone and to maintain proper standards for ourselves and for others, what happens through that humility? We are exalted. God lifts us up. God sees us and he sees our humility and we sees how much we need him. And when he sees that humility, what he, that God does is he pours out his love on us. He leads us to better places and he shows us better ways on how to serve him and how to be an encouragement and how to be a blessing to others. In the end, pride keeps us from being a blessing to others. And I know that's not what any of us want. All of us want to be a blessing to someone, not to be a curse. So to be a blessing, get rid of the pride. Recognize how it kills us and destroys us in every relationship and keeps us from being able to serve others and to bless others. Thank you for joining me for this What to Teach episode. I hope you were blessed by it. And before we end, let me pray for you as you continue to prepare yourself to teach God's word. Join me in prayer. Lord God, I do thank you so much for this study. I thank you so much for your children who went before us, who were great examples of what it means to follow you. And so I pray that we take their examples to heart and we look deep into our lives and see places where we need you, where we need to stand for you, and where we need to be humble in all that we do. I pray for each person who has watched this video. I pray over their lesson. I ask that you continue to give them insights, give them clarity, and give them encouragement to declare your word to those who will hear it. And for those who will hear, I pray that their ears be open, their hearts be open, that your spirit challenge and convict them so that they can be ready to receive your word and to put it into practice. So Lord God, we do love you and praise you. In your son Jesus' name I pray, amen.